Heather Boucher. Ms. Boucher is the Executive Director and Chief Economist at the Washington Center for Equ Equitable Growth and a Senior Fellow at the Center for American Progress. Her research focuses on economic inequality, public policy, specifically employment, social policy, and family economic well-being. She is the author of Finding Time, The Economics of Work-Life Conflict from Harvard University Press. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, it's quite an honor to be here today. What a fantastic group to be able to speak to about what are some of the most important economic policy issues of the day. Um, I'm going to talk about what I see as some of the economic evidence, which is what my organization focuses on. And um, I think it's clear that the defining economic problem of our time is creating good jobs and boosting middle class incomes within an era of high and rising inequality that we need to address. We know that output currently remains below trend. Firms continue to sit on profits rather than invest them, and we are stocked by debt. The long-term trend is that productivity rises, but as Larry talked about, wages and family incomes have not kept pace. Yet costs keep rising. Over the past decade, public university tuition is up by 42%, childcare costs up by 25%, and while the Affordable Care Act has helped, certainly, health care costs continue to pinch families. Yet even as profits soar, families struggle to find good jobs and afford a middle-class lifestyle, a problem especially challenging for families of color and those families headed by a single parent, most likely a mom. This is an issue of fairness, but it's also one of economic growth. I want to spend my few minutes talking about the multifaceted economic problem of inequality and the key pieces of the solutions um, that are evidence-backed that should be a part of our nation's economic policy agenda. So first, we have to address the income squeeze uh, by supporting the recovery and creating good jobs. Full employment, like we saw in the late 1990s, is the best way to reduce wage inequality, including and especially across racial and ethnic groups. The private sector has added jobs for 75 straight months. That's fantastic, but our work isn't done. The share of Americans with a job remains 3.7 percentage points below its peak just before the onset of the crisis, and a full five percentage points below its peak in 2000. We need to do more to invest in infrastructure and ensure that states maintain and increase their investments in education from pre-K up through college. Economic policy should focus on growing clean energy jobs and not give up on the idea that America is and can remain a leader in manufacturing. And of course, all three candidates who are still in the race argue that we can do better than the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Removing the systemic imbalance where corporations get rights that labor and the environment don't have would be a really good start. Second, we have to address the time squeeze. Families are coping with flat incomes even though most put in more hours at work than older generations and few have a full-time stay-at-home caregiver. Families work, but they do so without adequate labor standards or social protections like paid family leave, paid sick days, or sensible scheduling practices. This causes stress up and down the income ladder. We can learn from the four states that have now put in place universal paid family medical leave and the nearly three dozen that have implemented paid sick days. We should have a federal paid family and medical leave program. We now know that these policies improve health and economic outcomes for workers and their families, and that they are good for the economy, and they address inequality. Families, of course, also need safe, affordable, and enriching options for care for children and the aged during the workday. And this starts with increasing compensation and training of care providers and early educators and helping families afford that care. Let me be clear, though. To get at what ails our economy, we must focus on where the money goes. For too long, the rules governing our economy have allowed those at the top to siphon off the gains of growth for themselves, enfeebling our economy. So, my third point, let's ensure that the financial sector serves the real economy. Over the past quarter century, finance's share of all jobs has grown, while its share of all corporate profits has risen from 10% to nearly a third. That's unbalanced. Wall Street prioritizes short-term gains over long-term growth, at the same time, firms have pursued debt financing over plowing profits back into R&D, investing too little in America and in our economic capacity. Economic incentives must push in the right direction. 
Finance works when it puts savings in the hands of people who will invest in building up economic capacity and new ideas. Dodd-Frank was an important first step, and we must implement it and continue to work on this. Four, and this is my last key point, we should not be afraid to tax the top. For decades, we've been experimenting with trickle-down um, economics. We now know that low tax rates for those with the highest incomes did not create greater economic investment or growth. <laughs> what they did was create incentives for ever higher incomes and starved our federal government of needed funds for investments. The evidence supports an agenda that raises capital gains taxes, raises inheritance taxes, imposes a surcharge on millionaires, and considers a financial transactions tax. Without reigning in the top, our economy will continue to suffer from a lack of investment and innovation, and the gains of all we've created will be squandered on cake for a chosen few. Without strong incomes, our nation's middle class cannot drive consumption. We have to attend to both. And let me end by reminding us that the United States remains one of the richest countries that the world has ever seen. We can do this if we put our minds to it. And that should be, I think, front and center in the platform that you all are working on. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Any questions? Yes, Ms. Sandra. Hi, Heather. Hi, Nira. Uh, I wanted to ask you about tax policy. Uh, you talked about uh, the importance of taxes on the wealthy. Uh, you know, some, a lot of people have put forward higher taxes. There's been ideas of a multimillionaire surtax uh, that some candidates have adopted. What are, what are your more specific thoughts on uh, the ability of the wealthy to pay their fair share? It's a great question. Thank you so much for, for asking my former colleague at CAP <laughs> still. Um, uh, so I think that there, so there's a variety of, there's a, a lot of ideas that people have been talking about at the top. I mean, I think certainly, um, thinking about something like the Buffett rule that makes sure that people at the low end of the income spectrum aren't paying a higher tax share at those at the top would be an excellent first place to start. Um, we need to think about the kinds of, um, and you know, it gets so wonky, but the various kinds of loopholes at the top yes. that allow those who can afford fancy lawyers to avoid paying their taxes. Um, the most obvious and first one come, that comes to mind is to make sure that hedge fund managers, those people that run hedge funds, are pay, pay taxes the same way the rest of us do on our income. What we've allowed is those at the top to choose what kind of taxes they pay so they can sort of shop for the lowest rate, so we need to eliminate that. But we also need to be thinking a lot about what we can do to ensure that people cannot take their riches and park them overseas and not pay taxes. So, you know, the Panama Papers have now uh, ushered in a new sunlight on what um, wealthy individuals do. What can we do? And that's going to require, I think, more inter inter international cooperation. Mm -hmm. um, we also need to be thinking about um, the extent to which our tax system has privileged uh, lower rates on capital versus um, income taxes, mm -hmm. and whether or not that is that makes the most economic sense. Um, I think there's a lot of solid empirical evidence that it doesn't. And let me end this by, by noting um, uh, Emmanuel Saez, uh, one of the nation's foremost tax experts, is on my steering committee. And he did a paper with a couple of his colleagues a few years ago, really documenting that we could, and get this, hold on to your seats, raise taxes at the top by upwards of 80% and not have any negative effect on economic growth. Now, granted, that's an empirical paper, it's modeling exercise, but I think that what we're learning from the most cutting edge, um, serious empirical research in economics is that there's a lot of room to do more at the top. Thank you very much, yeah, Mr. Ellison. Congressman. Yeah, thank you for your presentation. Um, you know, one of the areas that people sort of at the upper income level benefit from is the mortgage um, interest uh, deduction. And um, you don't benefit it at all if you don't own a home. And if, even if you own one, if you don't uh, itemize, you don't, you don't benefit from it. And yet, uh, it's a huge amount of money. And at the same time, we don't have enough money to, to, to even adequately maintain our public housing stock, let alone house people, what if we converted that mortgage interest deduction to a mortgage interest credit, capped the, outcome, capped the, uh, the, the, the benefit at about $500,000, you know, value home, 
and then distributed the extra money to invest in housing for people. Is that something that might be one of the ideas that could have provide for more equitable uh, growth in our economy? And would it hurt, you know, I don't know, the millionaires who own multiple homes to, to not have that deduction, even if they could still get a credit for the, their first, on their first one? Uh, thank you, Congressman. That is a fantastic question. And I think there's two issues. Um, first is the extent to which our tax system generally privileges debt is a, is a bigger issue. So mortgages are one form of debt that we encourage families. Um, but I think we actually need to be thinking more seriously about debt more generally. As we've learned over the past few years, an economy built on debt is not stable. Um, but I'm glad you brought up the mortgage interest um, deduction because this is certainly something that high income people benefit from more than low income families. And um, I, I think we, it is, the time has come to consider whether or not we think that this makes good economic sense. And I think your, your suggestion is probably a really good thing to consider. Um, the, the challenge, of course, is whatever you do, um, it needs to be implemented in a way that doesn't have a, a, you know, a very immediate impact on the housing market. But having said that, I mean, this is going to affect primarily prices for homes at the very high end. Um, and if we think that making um, housing affordable, especially in, in communities that have really good schools, I think this could, this could be very helpful. And it could discourage uh, our over-reliance on debt. Thank you. Thank you.